Hello, everybody, and welcome back to this final event in Open Access Australasia's uh, series of events for Open Access Week. Um, and so for this one, we're going to be looking at and discussing an access of uh, an aspect of accessibility that I think is often overlooked, which is that we often communicate our research only in highly specialized formats aimed at other people in our narrow subfields. Um, but in order to make uh, knowledge transfer between people as effective as possible and as equitable as possible, there's this increasing need to also be able to translate our knowledge into ways that are, are more accessible for uh, people in other research fields, people who aren't researchers, people who might be putting this into practice, or simply people who are interested in the cutting edge of knowledge that um, we're inhabiting. So before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land that I am situated on, um, as well as their deep history and continuing contribution to this region. I would like to pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend this respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait and Maori people from other communities who are here today. Um, I would like to uh, also invite you all to reflect on the land that you're currently situated on. Uh, additionally, just to get practicalities out of the way, we're going to be recording this session, so please keep your microphone and camera off. Uh, and the recording is going to be made available on the website in the coming week if you want to share it with colleagues. You can also add questions into the chat and we'll hopefully be able to bring up a couple at the end. Uh, and we'll also be doing a couple of polls through this session through uh, Zoom's own poll functionality. So those should pop up at various points. Um, but with that, I'm going to hand over to the chair of this session, Sally Murray Walsh, in order to introduce the panel. Thank you so much, Thomas. Um, I would also like to pay my respects to the Awabakal Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of the land where I live and work. Um, so to start off our introductions, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Drew Berry. Uh, Drew is a biomedical animator who creates beautiful, accurate visualizations of the dramatic cellular and molecular action that is going on inside our bodies. Combining expertise as a cell biologist and artist, he translates abstract and complicated scientific concepts into vivid, meaningful visual journeys, which have been exhibited from the Guggenheim to the Royal uh, Institution. Next on our panel, we have Dr. Emma Beckett, the Miss Frizzle of Food and Nutrition Science. Emma is a passionate science communicator and has written articles for The Conversation, The Newcastle Herald and Lateral Magazine, as well as appearing multiple times on local and national radio and presenting at numerous public events. Emma's science communication work focuses on nutrition myth busting and empowering the public to interpret nutrition research without falling prey to the marketing hype. Our next panelist is Elliot Bledsoe, who runs Agentry, an arts marketing micro consultancy that helps artists and art organization tell their stories. He also has an extensive background in copyright with a focus on the interplay between rights and creative practice. And lastly, unfortunately, Dr. Chin, who couldn't make it today. Um, however, she is a fantastic uh, science communicator um, and well worth checking out her website. So I'm just going to drop that in the chat for you guys to take a look at. Um, alrighty. So throughout this week, we have seen insightful panels from many, many, uh, many, many amazing people. And it's become obvious that open can mean so many things and that open uh, access in particular is tasked with covering a lot of ground. So for our final session of OWEEK 2021, we're gonna take a look at the exclusionary barrier caused by academic communication and ways in which you can make your research findings more accessible. We know that academics and researchers are under a lot of pressure to be able to teach, research, publish, attend conferences, and all of this while being cited and recognized in the right academic places. But what about communicating their research to the masses? At the end of the day, isn't that what research is really about? During late two, uh, 2020, I attended an online research support conference and watched multiple talks from various researchers. And while many of these uh, researchers were from outside my own area of knowledge, 
For many of the talks, it was only a matter of minutes or one confusing slide too many before I felt the walls of academia rising before me. Here I was, able to actually go to the conference and I couldn't understand what they were saying. I was feeling very let down. <laughs> but conferences aren't typically open or accessible to all and the format and presentation style remains rooted in academia. So to begin our questions, I'm gonna direct our first one to uh, Emma. How did you manage to break free of the constraints of academic communication when it seems like you're so, you know, you have to be so tied to the system? Oh, I, I love that question because I'm not sure I ever fit into the constraints of the academic system. I think I always felt a little bit like an outsider because I would read this flowery language and think, why didn't they just say that? In a, in a simple way. And I felt all through my undergraduate degree that the language was keeping me from accessing information. And for me, my penny dropped moment was when I was doing my PhD, I was lucky enough because I was on a really small campus. Um, I, I was doing some development stuff, um, a writing circle with um, a multidisciplinary team. So on the big campus, you would do just a science writing circle and everyone would feed off each other's science-ness. But I was in there with humanities and business and any discipline you can think of. Um, and in the writing circle uh, one day, the facilitator, um, we were identifying what we call road bumps in our writing, speed bumps in our writing. And I had this sentence that was really long and complicated. And she said, what did you mean by that? And I said, oh, I meant this. And she said, well, just write that then. <laughs> and after that, I was like, that is really how I need to write. I just need to write what I want to say. I don't need to think about fitting into a stereotype. So that just empowered me to, to just start speaking like a normal person in my everyday work. And I'm not very good at spelling grammar or big words to start with. So it made me a lot more comfortable. Fantastic. Uh, Drew or Elliot, would you like to share how you've broken free of academic constraints as well? Oh, Drew, you're there muted are. still. Uh, go ahead. There we go. Save my voice. Um, uh, yeah, so I started in academia, so I was introduced to cell biology that way, but I'm, I, I really worked outside of it since. And I, it's because I got um, disillusioned with uh, grant writing and all that sort of stuff, but I love the science. And so I've been, um, uh, you know, working with scientists of my entire career. And really my job is to translate uh, what we can't see, but we're discovering in very meticulous detail about how our cells and molecules work and being able to show people it in action. So it's all about transforming this into something that you can watch in action and intuitively understand because uh, to describe it in words is, um, you know, the fog of science, the fog of uh, language that scientists use uh, will prevent anyone from understanding what they're talking about. So um, I, I turn to a, a visual story. Fantastic. And Elliot, I feel like you might have a different take, not being quite so constrained in the first place in the academic sphere. So what's your sort of take on, on this kind of way of transforming communication? Yeah, look, definitely. I was going to say it's probably confession time from my end to say that I'm not an academic. Um, there's no point looking me up on Orchid or Google Scholar or anything. I think there's maybe three things you might find if you do. Um, but I have had a long you know, a, a lot of experience working in communications and particularly thinking about kind of what communication channel and what audience makes sense for how you want to convey a message. You know, in my work, I do a lot of uh, kind of uh, different types of communication, everything from, you know, visual material through social media to, you know, longer form uh, blog content to writing submissions to government. So, uh, in every one of those scenarios, you need to be mindful of the channel that you're using, but also who the audiences are. And particularly that it's very rare that it's a single audience. So you need to be thinking about how you design and communicate a message in a way that can be understood in a range of different consumer, uh, sorry, customer journeys. So that different audiences who are engaging with what you're saying will have different reasons for why they're engaging with it have different experiences of how they want to engage with it, that it's often, you know, not as simple as going, I'm going to put this out on 
X channel and that's going to make sense and be meaningful to everybody who happens to scroll past it on their, you know, Facebook timeline. Yeah, fantastic. So I guess that, that really works in well with the next sort of question we had, um, which is about how do you go about you know, deciding on a platform that you want to use or a medium? Um, and how do you take, you know, your, your research paper or um, you know, whatever it might be, the, the content that you actually want to share and, you know, translate it into the right space for that, um, in, into that right medium? Because not everything, as you're saying, is, is made for the same space. You're not going to be putting, you know, a Twitter um, post into a grant submission, for instance, or, or things, but maybe you will. I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> Um, so this one's open to the panel. So whoever wants to uh, to take that one, don't be shy. Come on. I might jump in uh, just quickly and say one of the the mechanisms I use is to ask my partner about things. So if I use certain language and my partner is uh, you know more interested in what he's watching on Netflix then it's probably a pretty good indication that the communication is not going to work. Uh, you know, so if I come in and, and I talk about something like territoriality and copyright uh, and my partner's eyes glaze over, then that's probably a pretty good indication I need to think about a different approach to it, you know. So thinking about things like uh, actually how consumers access content and often end up locked out of content because of territorial rights relationships, you know, that's a very different way of communicating the same idea uh, and one that... Uh, you know, might hold its attention from Netflix for a slightly longer. That's a great example. Drew, we're we going to go next. Oh, no, Emma. Uh, Emma? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I was just going to say, I think I'm probably not a great expert to answer this question because for me, a lot of my selection of the platform or the media is very haphazard. Um, I started out on Twitter because I was looking to communicate with other professionals. Um, and then that developed into communicating with uh, everyone and, you know, normal people. Um, and, you know, whether you're deciding that you want to write a conversation article or an, an ABC uh, life article or an opinion piece for your local paper really depends on the situation. So I'm very much, um, I've got something I want to say and then figure out where it's going to fit. I, I haven't ever really had a strategy for any of that story. Um, and I guess um, to show my age, my the nature of the work that I'm doing is really to support the scientists that I work with in, in, in medical research for them to explain their um, topics on, and it, uh, when, when I started it was in the 1990s and uh, 2000, Thousands. I used to distribute videotapes to the various TV channels who would turn up to you know for a new cancer discovery and would be on the channel six you know channel nine news at six o'clock and um, uh, so I provide you know, I had ten seconds or less to visually explain the cancer discovery through visuals so that's where it began um, but so my my really to get back to your question is what is your audience that you're actually Wanting, is it just a blanket you want to get is just just have balls and you you know you want massive of a, you know something to go viral or something or is it you are have a, an audience who are genuinely interested in you whatever it is that you're presenting and you want to give them an authentic you know inter, you know insight into what it is that you're trying to explain so and that takes a lot more work or a different kind of work actually so um, you know it depends on the audiences but I also think I think you should aim for the the most important audiences to you first, and everything else is gravy. So you know, um, for me, it's explained to uh, high schools and the public uh, what uh, discoveries are being made. Um, but if everything else is just, it's a bonus. Okay. Well, Drew, I've got a bonus question for you that I'm so curious to know. You said just then about the 10 seconds, you had 10 seconds to convey what you would mm -hmm. like your message to get across. A lot of complaints yes. coming through these days is that, um, you know, people that are coming straight from school have a very short attention span. Now, 10 seconds isn't that long. Mm -hmm. um, and for those of you mm -hmm. that are on TikTok, you know that, you know, they've just expanded to three minute videos. Now, what for you do you see like has actually changed in this space? Do we have more time? Do we have a bigger attention span or is it the same? Uh, I, well, no, I think the nature of the media is uh, the culture, um, the culture of all of our media, the way we, we take, you know, the mobile devices, the way we're consuming things is, 
is radically different. And I also think um, with video game technology um, and just computers in general, the sorts of capabilities that we have now, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's changing times, um, but I think it's very exciting. Um, so I think uh, that, you know, again, I, I mean, I'm always grounded in who I want to speak to first and explain some particular topic. So I'm sorry I digressed a bit there, but um, yeah, that, it's because uh, my focus and my, my focus and attention is always on the science itself. And um, I try very hard to interpret and represent that as authentically as possible uh, for education. And then it has a, a purpose beyond that. Okay. So with, uh, I mean, with what you've just said there, you, how do you balance mm -hmm. accuracy while making it accessible? I mean, I've had a look at a couple of your visualizations, Drew, and they are just mm -hmm. mind boggling. Like they're amazing. Um, I don't, I'm not necessarily Thank a science you. person. I'm a history background, but I was still like amazed mm -hmm. and it kept my attention. I wanted to keep looking at it. Um, but where did, like, how do mm -hmm. you find balancing accuracy um, versus that accessibleness? How much do you dumb down the information in a sense? Um, so I don't dumb down. Um, the science is real, as real as I can possibly make it and bring it in, but I care very much about the uh, cinematography, the, the emotional feel. Um, so I use sound and color to make you react to it. And quite a lot of the topics I'm working on are horrific, like, you know, cancers or how parasites work or, you know, uh, cells committing apoptosis and destroying themselves. So um, they're dark themes. So dark sound, sound effects, uh, horrific sound effects, which makes it memorable and also engrossing. So, um, you know, those are all uh, artistic aesthetic choices, but they're part of the engagement process uh, that I care very much about too. Okay. Emma, Elliot, what do you guys think about balancing that accuracy versus making it accessible? How do you go about that? I think for me, the, the golden rule is remember you're talking to people, not at them. Um, and as long as you're doing that, you're you're going to be addressing people on a level that, that they're going to engage with. Um, and I think the other important thing is um, a lot of my work's written or it's radio or it's social media. Um, and you've got to really think about academically, they teach us to write with, you know, start with the overarching introduction and then, you know, start really broad and then drill it down to your specific question and your specific thing you're going to do. When you're talking to people who are outside of your field, you need to flip that and do it the other way around. Start with the headline, the most important bit first, and then put the detail in for the people who want it. So whether that's, you know, having a headline thing on your social media, then threading the details that only half the people are going to read to the end of, or whether that's um, starting with the, the most important information in the, the top paragraph of a written piece or saying the, the sound bite bit that you want everyone to remember at the beginning and the end of the radio interview. Um, but using ways that you can link out to information. So if people really want to track it down and find out the detail, that's okay. But you don't necessarily have to share that with everyone. So, you know, ending an interview with, if you want to know more, you can go and look at this or ending a thread with here's the actual paper that that came from, but knowing not everyone's going to want to step through to that level of detail. Nice. The important thing is is always about the medium, right? You need to be able to acknowledge your sources and, and where information comes from, but that has to be relevant to the medium or, or appropriate for the medium. You know, it's difficult to acknowledge, you know, 40 or 50 academic papers you might have referenced when you're putting a visual tile on Facebook with three lines of text. Um, that said, though, I think there are mechanisms for how you can do that, you know, including simple uh, you know, straps of information at the bottom that say something like, you know, uh, this information has been generated based on a range of sources which are viewable at this URL is a simple way of providing that level of credibility and authenticity that I think uh, is really important in an era of, uh, you know, the ability for misinformation to spread widely. I think it's it's about transparency and accountability. So making sure that that kind of information is available for those who care enough to look at it, but also that it's a visual marker that even if I'm not going to go and look at your list of references, the fact that I know there is one changes how I perceive the information that's being presented. Similarly, doing things like 
tagging the social media assets of some of the other related bodies or academics or institutions, universities that you might have worked with or engaged with builds that sense of credibility because you're openly notifying other people in the ecology that this is information you're distributing that relates to you know, either a project they've been directly involved in or something that they've done that you've relied on. And so that gives, look, it's certainly not the kind of robustness of, of peer review, but it certainly at least creates a more transparent uh, way of communicating through through certain channels, such as, you know, link backs to, to websites and blogs or uh, tagging social media assets. So at least it encourages other players to look at it and go, yep, okay, I think that makes sense. I'm happy with that. Or to say, actually, I'm not quite sure that's right. I don't think that quite represents what we did or the project we were working on. So it encourages, you know, transparency and critical review of the content that's going out on these platforms. Now, for most users, they're not going to know or care about that. But what's important is that it is there, right? So if it does come under scrutiny, there is a, a, essentially a, an online paper trail that you can follow that demonstrates where this information has come from, who's the voice behind it, and people can make an assessment on how creditable that is. Sal, can I just add, Elliot, I love all of that, completely yeah, agree. Um, I, I would add to, um, to be open to questions. So if it's something you're putting on social media, if people then query, you need to be prepared to say, here's more information or have an actual discussion with them to either help them understand or correct your understanding because I've I've been wrong in, the, in public before and a scientist who's more specialist in that area than me has come in and said, actually it's this and I've we've had a discussion and then we've put the correct information out there together. Um, and if you're doing a radio interview or if you're going on TV or if you're writing an article, be prepared that there's going to be a comments section um, or there might be people who will ring you up on the radio yeah. or there might be people who hear you on the radio, then Google you and find your email address and send you a question. If you're going to be sharing information publicly, you do need to be prepared to engage with that because if we ignore the questions, then we're cutting off the, the dialogue and it's not really accessible if we can't make it a, a two-way street. Though be careful with the comments, sometimes they can get nasty depending on your area. Um, so make sure that you're mentally prepared to disregard those ones um, if you're in that situation. Since we're headed down that way, we had this question for a little bit later, but we may as well ask it now. So negative feedback, you know, you are putting yourself in a position to receive feedback in, you know, a very ruthless manner at times on the internet. Um, and from some of the things I've heard about peer review, I've never actually um, you know, published an academic article. Um, so I've never been peer reviewed, but from some of the horror stories I've heard, it's not too far off what the internet does. So I'm curious as to how you guys handle negative feedback um, you know, and how, how different is it from the peer review process in the, in the terms of you know, negative feedback? Can I take that one first? I would I would sure. love if you could block some peer reviewers occasionally, um, the same way you can on social media, um, but unfortunately you cannot. Um, transparency is becoming a lot better in peer review now, though, and I actually reminded a peer reviewer recently when they were being really unacceptably difficult in their comments. They wanted me to do one thing, then they wanted me to do the opposite, then they wanted me to go back to what I had originally. Um, I said, I'd like to remind you, this journal publishes the peer review comments and responses with the paper. So you really need to decide which of these it is that you want. Um, but yeah, I get a lot of negative feedback, um, not about my science communication, because, you know, that's not something that's very easy for people to attack but I get a lot of negative feedback about myself as a human I get comments about my weight and my appearance and how can I possibly be a nutritionist when I'm so chonky and are you sure you've got a degree in food and nutrition oh you must have just eaten all the food um, or if I wear a donut dress donut print dress I get comments about promoting obesity and and those kinds of things um, so I get a lot of trolls, I get a lot of hate online for being a large woman in the food and nutrition space. Um, and most women who are public online will get hate for whatever it is they're doing just because, you know, the patriarchy. Um, so it is quite difficult sometimes, but I think it's important to remember that those people are not really attacking you, they're attacking some bigger concept of 
society that they're mad about. Um, and I'm really lucky. I guess I'm missing the part in my brain where I take it personally. I'm, I'm like, well, that's a you problem. That's not a me problem. Um, and I always like to turn the really difficult moments into teachable moments. So if someone has a go at me about my weight, then that's a great opportunity to start a conversation about weight being only one marker of health. And here's all the other things that you really want to focus on for health instead of weight. Um, or if someone says, oh, how dare you wear that donut dress? Um, that's promoting diabetes and obesity, that's where you start a conversation about diabetes is actually a complex disease and don't go throwing all the diabetics under the bus and saying that they cause this themselves by eating badly. Um, you need to understand this is a complex disease. Diabetics can actually eat donuts um, and, you know, talk about the, the complex um, determinants of health as opposed to just demonizing or, or worshiping particular foods. So I like to turn all of the hate into teachable moments and it always ends up with more good energy than bad energy. So far, that's not a challenge if any trolls are watching. I love that. I love that you can you can take something that's, you know, then they're not really trying to talk about what you're actually talking about. And yet you can deflect it in such a way to actually get back to that message. Drew? Uh, yeah, well, bravo, Emma. I pre appreciate all of that. It's um because I, I get to hide behind my animations. I usually don't. I don't like uh, putting my person, my real person, uh, you know, in, in this way. And so, and I also, also I really, you know, it's uh, the nature of social media, all, all of this sort of the way people are interacting and the, where the audiences are, it's it's really challenging. And um, I mean, uh, so we have to find ways of navigating that. Uh, but certainly, I mean, as, as an artist, I get criticisms too, I guess, through, you know, YouTube comments and such. But, you know, I, I, I also soak up the positive ones too. So, um, and actually the, you know, the negative ones um, are often helpful. I don't know, I, I've been doing this long enough that I'm not too precious about what I do, uh, but I certainly, it does sting from time to time, but just try and stay focused on the pos positive people uh, and, or the positive reactions and because they're your audience. That's who you want to speak to again. Mm. I definitely think both Emma and, and Drew are right and have made some really valuable and important points about, you know, kind of coming in with the right mindset for it. So if you're having a particularly difficult time or your mental health is struggling a little bit, that's probably not the best time to jump in and look at the comments. Um, so having mechanisms to support yourself in that process, also taking those opportunities to really emphasise the positive and downplay the negative, because the reality is, unfortunately, in the internet, haters are going to hate, right? So we have to be aware of that. When you make any kind of public statement through any public channel, and let's not mistake it, in, social media is a public channel. Uh, when you're making any public statement, you have to be ready for any kind of response that the public can have. And so I actually think institutions that are doing research need to do more to support academics to understand how to manage risk communications, how to anticipate what those outcomes might be and plan communications for it. On top of that, I also think that a lot of the work that I do with a number of the artists that I'm working with actually translate and is completely relevant and appropriate for the academic space. For a lot of the artists I'm working with, what I say to them is that you have to make a decision about how much of your personhood is part of your personal brand. Right, especially where what you do is tied to your personal brand, like an artist performing under their own name or an academic publishing under their own name, you have a direct correlation between you and the public facing brand. That doesn't mean you have to go Kardashian on it and put everything into your brand. You can draw a line in the sand, right? So I go through mechanisms with artists where I say things like, are you happy for your kitchen? to be part of your brand, the, the visual element of your kitchen or your bedroom or your artist studio or your backyard? Are you happy for your key interests, ideas, motivations, opinions to be part of the public space? Uh, are you happy for your partner and your kids to be part of your visual brand? If, if th some of those are in and some of those are out, then actually just make a list, write yourself a list that says, this is what I'm happy being part of my public persona. And this is what I'm not. And then use that as a mechanism for controlling what information you put out in any public space, right? Because yes, you can Google somebody and find their email address and 
you know, unfortunately, your academic email is probably going to be public somewhere, but certainly your personal email or your home address or, or who your kids are or your partner is and where you go to school or maybe where you worship or something like that doesn't have to be part of your public brand. Uh, I do think, you know, whether we're talking about artists or we're talking about academics, there's a lot more room for teaching people how to better manage their personal information online so they can better control what that perception is and keep the bits that they don't want to be part of the public eye out of that. Elliot, I think that is so right. And can I just add that I think um, being you as a person in your communication of your research is one of the ways we make research more accessible. Um, by us being accessible as humans, we break down this experts versus the general public divide um, that, that's really so negative. And, you know, the ivory tower and the, the plebs who don't know anything and that whole old school gatekeeper um, style of things, that whole anti-expert sentiment things by being us in our communication, uh, we help make ourselves part of the access to information as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's really important, but absolutely agree with everything Elliot said. And I'm going to remember to um, speak to the university about training people to, to understand that risk when they communicate a little bit more, because I wish I'd had that when I'd started out. Yeah, that's so important. Creating that, that safety for yourself um, and your, you know, your own person. Um, that's that's fantastic, and that's you know, we're seeing a lot of that becoming an issue with with people on, you know, things like Twitch and TikTok, where they're inviting people essentially into their life, and then they're copying things, which the internet, um, and then you know, it is taking a dramatic toll. So that's that's a great point, Elliot. Thank you for making that, and um, I think we might have to contact you for some training, <laughs> perhaps. Um, all right. So with that, we're about halfway through. So I'd like to. Um, run a quick poll. Now, um, panellists, feel free to also um, put your answers in the poll. Um, so Thomas, if we can kick off the poll, it should only take a couple of minutes to get done. Um, and if you, uh, if you have any questions while we're taking the poll, feel free to pop them in the chat for us. I love watching these move as people jump in. It's like election night. It's super cool. Hey. Now, I love this question. Um, the first question about, you know, your non-academic friends and family, um, because as, uh, as a librarian, um, my grandma doesn't know what I do. She thinks I sit in a library and read books all day and I tried to explain a couple of times what I do and she just couldn't get past the fact that I didn't touch physical books most days. Um, so we've just, we've kind of just, we just stopped discussing how that works. Um, it's a bit, bit much for her, but um, you know, she is 86, so fair enough. I guess as a provocation while the poll's going, I'd ask, does it actually matter if people know what you do? Rather, should the question be more about can people understand the value of what you do rather than what your job title is or what that might look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, that's a great one. I like that reframing. For example, in my consultancy, I don't have a position title because I don't see the point because okay. I'm a micro consultancy who works on their own. So I'd have to hold every position title. I like it. Okay, now, quick question for the participants and possibly Thomas. I can only see question one. Can you guys see any other questions? I can't click anywhere to, to show me any of the other questions. Yeah, it should just be question one. So we, uh, to put the next questions up, we clear the previous one and put up the next. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Fantastic. Well, let's head to the second question. Aha, got it. I think, Elliot, as well, what you were saying earlier about, you know, choosing what you wish to share in particular places. Um, I have multiple uh, accounts for things that I 
like to share and then things that I don't want to put on there. Um, for instance, my partner and I are building a house, building a barn, and we have an account that just features that. And we don't talk about anything else. We don't talk about where we are, anything like that. Um, and that's all we have on that. And I quite like that for that purpose because I don't, they don't have to know who I am. Mostly Americans that follow us, that kind of thing. It doesn't, you know, it's just about that one project. It's great. I think it's really freeing actually. Whereas I'm total opposite. I put everything in everywhere because blurring the lines is where me and my my personality and, and my science and information have the, the most impact, I guess, for, for what I'm trying to do. So yeah, yeah. courses for courses. And I'm going to yeah. look up this barn page. Yeah. I want to know about it. <laughs> 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 fantastic guys okay so we've got yeah we've got a bit of a split here about whether or not we love and use social media or no but would like to so could, could the people who said there. yes that they hate it if you're on social media and you hate it please tap me because I would love to help you love social media. Not everyone has to love social media, but sometimes it's it's hard when you're new at it and you need to be embraced. So if, you, if you're trying it and you hate it and you're on one of the platforms I'm on, hit me up and I'll help bring you into that community. That's lovely. Thanks, Emma. All right, let's head to the next question. So I think this one's a really interesting one and something we've kind of talked on the panel about is, you know, that actually translating the message for the medium, just putting your, you know, your DOI or your title, um, if it's an academic paper, isn't going to catch the eye, like you said earlier, Emma, um, it's about, um, you know, if it could be shouted from a, um, you know, a talking post and people would catch their attention and stop them, that's the kind of title that is going to be important. Um, Drew, I'm curious how you title things um, for your visualizations. How do you find and titling wise, like how do you go about it? Uh, I mean, like text uh, labels. Um, so that's that's a key yeah, part of tagging all those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, so so my my the animations themselves they're there just to the, the the ideal animation is one without narration that just has a little bit of text to prompt you as to what you're looking at and the animations should stand for itself to lead you through the story and be meaningful um but um i think just to also just to step back also what emma was talking about by social media i don't know i i guess is is that really the priority, I, I, not, for, not for me, and I, I'm an, too much an introvert to, I, I occasionally stick my head out like a turtle into Twitter and then back off again. And, you know, because uh, to me, it's, it's, it's exhausting. It's amazing. I get why people love it. Um, I follow it for my US politics and all the rest, but um, it, it's, a, it's a very, I don't know, I, I'm not, I don't know whether everyone has to do it, but um, I certainly see the value in it. I can see why you think it's no, interesting I understand. doing US politics. <laughs> All right, Thomas, let's pop up the last question for the poll. So Emma, with your research, you know, we're talking nutrition, we're talking food. I love that you dress with food in mind. I think it's it's a fantastic way of translating your message and your fashion and you know it's just great um do you engage in other research fields that are outside of you know science and nutrition area i do so my my social media is primarily about food and nutrition um, and i kind of leaned into the the food themed dressing when when i got my first food outfit and people went oh food I get that. And I was like, oh, wait, this is what the influencers do. I'm stealing that. And I started using the outfits to start conversations that I wanted to be having. Um, so that's mostly what my socials are. Um, but each, I'm really lucky um, each week on our local ABC radio, I get to go on the radio for five, 10 minutes at the end of the show and 
share research coming out of our campus. So that means I get to profile a different researcher from my campus each week. And I do that in business. I do it in history, humanities. I do exercise and sports science. I've done oral health. So all of those things are totally out of my comfort zone. Um, so I have to spend a little bit of time, you know, reading a paper outside of my field and then kind of reframing it as the who, what, where, when, why to go on the radio. I'm really lucky our, our local ABC radio host is, is very interested in, in research in the university and he really helps bring uh, that excitement. Um, but I definitely think that if you, you take the time and, um, you know, use the tools you have, you can definitely do it outside of your own expert area as well. And I always really love when I, I tell a researcher I'd like to feature them on the radio. This week I did um, a nursing research project and her research was on um, the concept of social conscience in perioperative nursing. And so her research was, uh, what is this idea of social conscience, which is a, an abstract term uh, that they use to describe the care that a nurse has to take to keep the patient safe during surgery, during and after, after surgery. And she said to me, Emma, no one's going to want to know about that. Um, why would you want to put that on the radio? And I said to her, well, we frame it as isn't it great that nurses are thinking about these things, that, that even though it's a traditional uh, profession, they're not just handing down knowledge that they just do it the way they've always done it because uh, that's what the person before them told, told them to do. They're actually thinking about putting names on these practices and figuring out what the attributes of those practices are so that they can figure out if they can do it better, do it smarter, how they can train people in it and how they can call it out when it's not happening. So that became a really awesome story about how nurses really care about us and and want to do the right thing so you know any story can be exciting um to, to everyone if you give it the right framing so that's that's really really fun and something lucky that i get to do yeah actually sorry emma but what you just demonstrated so brilliantly is also storytelling which is not uh, you, that you, you obviously are extremely good at it and uh you know that, that's a really hard skill and to, to be able to translate a story quickly like that from all these sorts of different uh, bits of research that you're having to explain and to convert it into a story that's very vivid for people is just, you know, that, that's it, that's, that's the gig. I'm glad you said that because I always feel like my stories are way too long and I was like, oh, how have I started this and when am I gonna wrap it up? <laughs> no, that's fantastic. That's what this is all about. That's, it's so good to hear. Um, thank you everyone for participating in the poll. Um, we're just going to change it up again. We're going to go to a few questions that have been put in the chat. So my remaining questions that I actually had for you guys have pretty much all been answered in our discussion, which I kind of assumed would happen, but it's just because you're such good communicators, you beat me to it. Um, so we had a question um, from Sylvia. Uh, great points about transparency you guys were talking about earlier in the session. I'm wondering about the panelists, uh, how the panelists deal with scientific unknowns in their communication. Um, so does anyone feel like they'd like to take that one on? I've been doing a lot oh, of this. Oh, oh. Oh, sorry, Drew, go ahead. Go ahead. No, well, that's the one that's what I I personally am dealing with all the time. Um, sorry, I had to jump in. Guys, it's a very passionate uh, topic of mine. Um, go for it. But it's, um, uh, it, it's first of all, you, you are, uh, that's the nature of science. It's always patchy and what we know and we, what we don't know. You do your best um, and you are also relying on the expertise of the person that you're communicating for and that, you know, you try and present through story um, the, the, the landscape, the, the context of what, what uh, the, the, the stuff is. So um, yeah, anyway, that, that's kind of what the, my attempt at how to address that. I was going to say I've been doing this a lot during the pandemic. Um, I'm a food and nutrition scientist now, but I also have a degree in epidemiology and my, my first life as a scientist was in infection and immunity and particularly in, in lung, lung infections. Um, and during the pandemic, trying to explain to people that we don't know everything about the pandemic and that you can't explain all of these things and everyone wants to compare Sydney to Melbourne and Brisbane to Sydney and Melbourne and what's Kerry Chant doing differently to uh, the 
chief health officer of a different state and how do we explain all of this you can't explain all of this everything has variance in it and there's luck involved and there's chance and it's been really challenging to get people to accept that we can't control everything because it's a scary situation that we really do want to control so even just the message that we don't know things is really important and i think this is where a lot of scientists go wrong in science communication is they want to answer all the questions and they want to be like bam i know this bam i know that i am the bringer of all knowledge and being able to say actually i don't know and actually i don't know we've we know that at all is is actually a really powerful way of showing people the process of science and that it isn't just about facts that things can evolve that originally the the advice was don't wear masks then the advice became wear masks it wasn't because we were wrong when we said don't wear masks it's because the situ situations the evidence behind that recommendation changed so being able to share the evolution of science with people is so important more now than ever that's great and there is such a power in saying to people i don't know and that's totally okay. I think people get so terrified when they're going to be, you know, in front of a, on a panel or in front of people and they're going to be asked something and they don't know. I think it's the most freeing thing to say, I don't know, but I can get back to you on that. Um, that's one of my favorite things to say, honestly. <laughs> um, Elliot, I think this question has your name all over it. It's from Kate Davis. Uh, so she's asked, how important is it to craft an online identity in social media to support the communication of your work? I think this is always an interesting one. It's something I, I deal with a lot with artists as well. Um, there is actually no golden rules to social media. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to use it. There are more common practices and less common practices to how people engage with these channels, but also the idea that each of these channels all operates in one homogenous way that every single use of it, every type of user that is engaging with it is all doing the same thing is a complete fallacy. So the reality is that social media can be a useful mechanism for amplifying the reach of your communication and the understanding of that. That doesn't mean that you have to use it. Um, you know, I think that what's important is who am I wanting to talk to and what do I want to say to them and is the language that I use going to be a barrier therefore I need to think differently about it right and how I communicate something on Twitter is going to be very different to how I communicate something on say the university's official Facebook page uh, corporate comms is probably going to want to get involved in there anyway. Um, but likewise, in a Facebook group about a, a scientific topic, my communication is going to be very different again, right? And so while you, if you're in this space, it's probably advisable to think about that persona and what you do want in and out of it. But also, you can't think of even that as a, a solid block, right? It's a permeable uh, entity in which it will expand and contract at times when you're in a space like a facebook group focused on a scientific topic you may be more open to putting more of yourself into that space because you're in a a circle of peers colleagues whereas when you're putting communication out through a broader more open channel on one of these networks then perhaps you want to be more guarded about what part of yourself you include in that space so Unfortunately, I can't give you an answer that says, yes, you should or no, you shouldn't, but rather think about a framework for understanding why you want to be part of these channels, but also that these channels are communities, right? And so why would you want to be part of this community? What do you want to say to it? And how will you be a valuable contributor to it, right? I often say to people, think of social media like you're going to a barbecue, right? You've, you're there with you know, your partner and you know nobody else or maybe the host, but pretty much nobody else, how would you start trying to communicate what you do in that scenario? If you just start uh, rambling off a, a, a you know, 30,000 word uh, thesis, uh, you're probably going to end up standing alone somewhere in the backyard. So, you know, I do think it is about thinking about uh, what channels are you using? Social is a really valuable channel for academics, but also it doesn't come without risks. It doesn't come without considerations. So um, establishing a persona on those spaces 
may be a useful tool for you, but actually there's no golden rule that says every academic or every artist has to be on social media. Can I just add, don't, don't make making a personality your sole aim. I, I know people who have gone in with this, I need my hook. Emma, you've got your outfits. What am I going to do? I know it will be a bow tie. Or, you know, they've looked for some kind of like way to make themselves stand out as a point of difference. Um, I think it's always easier if you let these things happen organically because it's much easier just to be you online than it is to be someone else online. So let the personality, the branding of you as a, a person online follow who you are really um, rather than trying to make something to get people's attention. That's great. And lastly, I think it'd be great to hear through your perspective as well as someone that's not so much in that social media but you, I couldn't say that you don't have a, you know, a presence, um, you know, in the World Wide Web, in, you know, the science field. So from your perspective, less on social media, but you still have that presence. What are your thoughts? Oh, I, I, I'm addicted to Twitter. I don't uh, deny that. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm loving science Twitter where you get, I follow all sorts of microscopists and they send, you know, all their beautiful cells. And, uh, you know, so for all of that, I, I, I totally get it, but it's more, um, I find it's, it, it's a river that's flowing so fast and to create content, particularly visuals, to keep that up is exhausting. It's, it's a lot of work. And what's mm. the point? Like, what, why am I doing that? Uh, versus uh, putting effort into other audiences in my, my YouTube, the various stuff on YouTube is, is uh, rewarding as well. Um, but it, it's, it's just a random, random people um, where really ultimately for me, who I want to communicate with is biology students and people who want to get into biology. So uh, the silent audience out there who are my biggest audience are, you know, um, that's where I get my reward or return from. I mean, my, my, so my, 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 my social media stuff is really me, just love and science. Um, I don't use it as a tool or try. I, I, I've tried a few times and I always just back off real quick because I just can't keep it up. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. Yeah, you're, you're right there. Well, I think that's a great spot to start wrapping up. So Thank you so much, panelists, Emma Beckett, Elliot Bledsoe, and Drew Berry. You guys have been fantastic. It has been such a pleasure to host today and talk to you guys. Um, you've been on my, uh, my wish list for a while to have a chat with you guys. So it's been great to do it in this space. Um, so before I hand over to Martin, um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to everyone that's helped um, in the planning committee of Open Access Week. Um, it's been a huge uh, couple of weeks as we've headed into the week that, that has been. Um, so thank you, Thomas Shaffey, for uh, being our fearless leader, Ginny Barber, Samantha Elkington Dent, Kate Davis, Kate Knox, Lucy Walton, Alicia Starr, who's also rocking the tech today. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, Nicole Floor Brown, Angela Booth, and uh, Sandra Fry. Um, so thank you all so much for helping and making this possible. Um, and again, a big thank you to our panelists for joining today. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Martin to wrap up today and the entire week. Take it over, Martin. Thanks very much, Sally. Hello, everybody. Here I am. Um, so I'm joining you from UNS. Um, so I'm joining you from University of New South Wales. Um, I'm also joining you from Gadigal land as well. So uh, I hope everybody agrees uh, that we've had a fantastic program uh, for Open Access Week this year. Uh, we've heard uh, from experts on growing the value of research. Um, we've also had a session talking about research assessment. Um, we had an OA hack, which is an escape room. Uh, we looked at the disciplinary differences. We also looked at the global challenges. Uh, also looked, um, also hearing about working with indigenous knowledges and also open educational resources. And lastly, today's session on making, which, um, was on making research accessible. So there's, um, I think, a lot of information to help everybody there with helping with the transition to open in your own institutions. Um, it's heartening that after all these years that we're making really some giant strides, um, I think, in reaching equity to research. Um, of course, we 
have to keep on pushing uh, for equity and for change. And I think now is the right time to keep on ramping up our efforts. Right. Um, so uh, I've, I've also been informed by Ginny um, that we've had really, 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 really large attendances to, um, to all of our webinars. I was able to attend all of them except for one. So registrations were over 1500 people, which I think is really, really amazing. Um, the attendance to our website as well was also similarly high um, with around visitors around 1400 this week and page views over 3500 so that really is a lot of activity, of course there's also been all the other tweaks and the other channels as well. So um, on the also on behalf of the open access Australasia and the executive committee, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, for which we had all week across all the webinars. And I'd especially also like to thank the organizing committee. Um, um, I won't mention all the names again because we just heard that from Sally, but thank you so much for just doing a really, really, really fantastic job. I think it was really amazing. Um, of course, the Open Access Australasia uh, this week, Open Access Week um, was part of International Open Access Week organized through Spark Europe. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank everybody who's attended, um, all of you who've attended all, all the webinars. Um, also like to thank you for all your tweets um, and all the contributions you've made uh, through the webinars and through all the other channels. So uh, with that, um, that is the end of Open Access Week for this year. And I really look forward also to being part of that in the next years to come. So thank you very, very much.